Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Family Research Council and uh, those of you who are here in person and welcome to those joining us on the web. My name is Peter Sprigg. I'm a senior fellow for policy studies uh, here at FRC and uh, I'm delighted to introduce our guest today. Uh, Glenn Stanton is the Director of Global Family Formation Studies at Focus on the Family in Colorado. He's also affiliated with the uh, Institute of Marriage and Family in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And he has debated and lectured extensively on issues of gender, sexuality, and marriage, and parenting uh, around the world. He's also the author of a number of books. Um, uh, I will mention uh, this one, which I, uh, I've read, read uh, Loving My LGBT Neighbor, Being Friends in Grace and Truth. Uh, a couple of others, the, the Ring Makes All the Difference, The Hidden Consequences of Cohabitation and the Strong Benefits of Marriage. And one that I think he's going to be addressing, uh, at least in part today, uh, Secure Daughters, Confident Sons, How Parents Guide Their Children into Authentic Masculinity and Femininity. femininity. Um, uh, Glenn is someone that I've known for a long time, basically as long as I've been at FRC. And... Um, and I really recommend uh, anything he writes. Uh, he also writes a lot of opinion pieces. Uh, a recent one it was at the Federalist, Seven Questions About Transgender People Answered. Uh, Glenn is one of those people who anything he writes is worth reading. So I, I, I really recommend, I recommend that. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to Glenn Stanton. Thank you so much, Peter. And he is right. Um, we have been friends for a good, good while. Um, we both started, he started at FRC, and I started at Focus on the Family when we were 11 years old. Um, that's how we look so youthful, having done this work um, for 20 plus years or so. But thank you so much for uh, the invitation and for allowing me to come. Um, the book, Secure Daughters, Confident Sons, um, I'm going to speak kind of from that, but I'm not going to be addressing the issue of Secure Daughters, Confident Sons. Tell you a story, a lot of you um, younger folks here. When you write a book, writing a book is like having a child. Um, and for the ladies here who have had children, it is just as painful, <laughs> right? Nothing. No, but you, 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 you give birth to this child, and then you give it off to the publishers and they name it and they dress it up. And you're just hoping they don't give it some crazy dumb name like Aloysius or something. <laughs> and you hope that they don't dress it up in just this goofy way. Well, Secure Daughters, Confident Sons, the book is about what does it mean to be male and female? And how do we raise boys and girls to be good men and women and do it as gender distinct parents, sex distinct parents as man and woman. But they wanted to put a title on there that was like about parenting. So um, many people think, well, what does that have to do with this topic? Um, the issue of the, scien the scientific objectivity of gender difference. Um, this is a very important and emerging topic because I don't know if you've been paying attention but the question of whether there is actually an objective male and female human nature is not even under attack. It is just categorically rejected out of hand. And as Peter said, I've had the privilege and I get to go around and debate the gender issue and same-sex marriage and things like that at college campuses, secular campuses around the country, and I've been doing that for quite a while. And I want to tell you just some quick stories, and these are not um, exclusive little stories that I've had to pick out here and there. But when I go to a college campus, typically it's debating, and I will say my primary premise in coming to speak to you is that humanity exists as male and female, that they have important significant differences, and that they need each other. And I just know like dropping a lead ball, something's gonna happen to that ball, okay? Just as, you know, natural if you will, as that ball dropping, 
the audience will either break out in boos or laughter, not because they think it's a funny joke, because like, oh my goodness, how could this guy be so ill-informed? And I want to tell you two stories. One was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and this was a PB, this was an NPR kind of event there. We were in this big, big, beautiful theater, you know, wood, everything, and I was debating um, Evan Wolfson, and I, you know, at the beginning of my talk, I made that statement, made that comment, and the place just erupts like I had offended or said their badger, you know, mascot was just something horrible. Laughter, boos, and hisses. I've never been hissed before, okay? <laughs> so this thing erupts, and I'm so used to it, and you just know it's going to happen. So what I did was I just stepped back from the podium, waited for it to die down. It took a while, quite literally. And I walked back up to the podium, and I go, okay, let's, let's just capture this moment. Let's capture what just happened. I said, I said that humanity exists as male and female, that they are different in many important ways, and that they need one another in their differences. And you guys laughed, you booed, and you hissed. Just silence, okay? So the group that sponsored this, they put that event later on online, the recording of it. So I, I listened to it, and I wanted to hear kind of how that part worked out. Edited it out. And they edited it out, not because to save room, but you simply call them on, and I don't mean this ugly, but just simply childish behavior, you know, in that way. Another time, this is at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and a lot of times, you know, I'm the guy from Focus on the Family, so I come and speak, and there are just people up in the front just glaring at me, you know, as if I've never experienced that, and they're just going to make me run off, you know, weeping um, <laughs> because of the intimidation. So I said that very thing, my introduction, <clears throat> and one woman right up here just, she creates this artificial laugh, <laughs> you know, and then she kind of looks at her friends like, and so I said, excuse me, what is your name? My name, my name is Jennifer, and you know, she says it like, good, I got your, you know, you took the bait. So I said, Jennifer, I wake up every morning, and I say one prayer primarily, Lord, please help me to bring joy to somebody's life, and Jennifer, today you were that person. <laughs> and you could just see that look on her face like, mm. You know, it's, it's important to just call these things for what they are. And this is a very important topic. And because it addresses the nature of what it means to be human, which is one of the most important questions that we can ask. Why? Because we are all human. God made us as humans. He endowed us with human dignity, which is why we need to be mindful of that for everybody regardless of what their story is, gay, straight, transgender, lesbian, otherwise, Presbyterian, Coloradan, <laughs> District of Columbian, you know, whoever. Um, and to understand what it means to be human, we have to understand what it means to be male and female, because I'm going to read an introduction. Um, to this. This is a wonderful book. Sylvia Ann Agazinski, who is a moderate to liberal feminist in France, well-placed, and she has helped, you know, run the equality movement there. Um, her husband, for quite a while, was prime minister. Um, this book, The Parity, The Parity of the Sexes, the, the Equality of the Sexes, she makes a very interesting statement, and our grandparents would just kind of roll their eyes at this statement. But she opens up one of the first chapters. She says this, one is born a girl or a boy. One becomes a woman or a man. 
The human species is divided in two, and like most other species, in two only. This division, which includes all human beings without exception, is thus a dichotomy. Another word for dichotomy is binary. Binary on the college campuses in gender study is a four-letter word, <laughs> even though it's not literally four letters. In other words, every individual who is not a man is woman. There is no third possibility. Regardless of what people like Facebook say, where there's 58 possibilities, there are only two possibilities, male and female. Okay? I wonder if she would get booed if she were to say that as a feminist. Probably. Okay. I want to start with a cartoon. This is from the New Yorker. I get the New Yorker, and they really have wonderful cartoons because they will just poke fun at a number of sort of liberal truisms. And I love this, okay? Big CEO, um, he's got one of his subordinates there, pictures of his kids and his wife there. He says, he says we're very fortunate to be blessed with one of each, okay? If gender theory is true, there would be no joke there, right? But of course, just like Agazinski says, there are only two. You know, that for regular life where we're not, where it's not primarily proposed that, oh, no, 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 there's, you know, binary is bad, that there's a rainbow of genders and things like this, common sense people, even at the New Yorker, realize, you know what, all in all, there are two genders. It's interesting when I travel. Sometimes you go, you know, well, you'll always go through security there, and sometimes you get patted down. Male assist on three, female assist on four. I've never heard ambiguous assist on aisle 13, <laughs> you know. Real quick interesting thing, if you want to know how to never get patted down going through security, ask to be patted down. <laughs> They will not touch you. I do that all the time. Excuse me, could I have a pat down? Um, the question is, is there a universal male and female nature? Not is there a male and female nature, but is there one that is humanly universal? Meaning, we can observe it, and we see it, and we experience it at all places, at all times, in all cultures? That is a big, big question. There are very few things that we see human experience-wise in all cultures, at all times, in all of humanity. And so we need to ask this question, is there a universal male or female nature? Now, if you go by current elite theoretical orthodoxy, of course there's not. Because male and female are simply and merely cultural constructs, social constructs. Each of you who are presenting here as male or female, you are only presenting that way because the culture dictates this, and our culture particularly, dictates that this is what males look like and this is what females look like. And if we could just simply set ourselves free from those cultural constructs, these false constructs, then we would really be free and authentic to who we are as human beings. Is that true? Or is there a fundamental, universal male and female nature? It's interesting, the anthropologists study this kind of stuff. It's the study of human universals. Donald Brown, Donald E. Brown, has a wonderful book called Human Universals. And he talks about these things that we see in all cultures at all times. There's a couple of interesting ones that we wouldn't think of. Music is one. Sense of humor is one. Dancing is one. Toys are one. I mean, there's these things that, you know, we don't think of as necessarily humanly universal, but humans all over express them. Another one is male and female and male and female marriage. Okay, if there is not, and I'm going to show you a picture, 
if there is not an objective male and female nature, and if we are actually just a spectrum across the board of male and female, then this gentleman, <laughs> his shtick means nothing, right? I mean, he operates just like that New Yorker cartoon. He operates on this idea that, okay, I'm a man, my name's Richard, but I'm not going to be a typical man, nor am I going to be quite woman. I'm going to, you know, blend these two things together in a, and it's his shtick. It's his deal, and he knows what he's doing, and it works for him. But think about this. If we literally have a rainbow of genders, then we would just see, you know, Richard Simmons is a such and such on that spectrum. But that is not how we see it. There is, and I'm going to talk about this body of literature um, in more detail, and I brought a number of the studies. I'm not going to read them to you, um, but I'll explain to you why I brought them. But there is a wide and large body of literature from um, biosocial or evolutionary psychologists. Okay, so these are not conservative people. These are not traditionalist people. But these evolutionary psychologists going to lots of different cultures in the world, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a second, are finding answers to this question. Is there a humanly universal male and female nature? Now, again, I'm going to come back to this. But there are a number of physical, biological scientists who have looked at this question. And I want to just present the information on, from some of these. Um, Anne Moore and um, David, David Giselle, he is a PhD. Anne Moore is um, more of a popular journalist, but study science, things like this. They wrote a book called Brain Sex, The Real Difference Between Men and Women. They say at the very beginning of their book, and I love this because they are not conservatives, they just state it like it is based on their research. It's time to cease the vain contention that men and women from a biological sense are created the same. They are not, and no amount of idealism or utopian fantasy, I wonder why they put forth utopian fantasy and idealism there. No amount of those two things can alter that fact. They go on to say the truth is that virtually every professional scientist scientists, those people that deal with objective things that you can observe and study in a test tube, if you will, has concluded that the brains of men and women are different. I'm going to quote another scholar here in just a minute that you all should know um, in her work. They go on, there has seldom been a greater divide between what intelligent Enlightened opinion presumes the elites that men and women have the same brain and what science knows that they do not. Now, first of all, on the college campuses, again, if, if we were a secular campus here, there would just be outrage. And we have to understand why that is. Because they understand only on this issue that difference means inequality. Difference means inequality. To say that men and women are different means that women are less. Well, I like to ask this question. There are differences between Italian food and sushi, but nobody, not even the, the feminists themselves, would say, why don't you think sushi is as good as Italian food or vice versa? But that's exactly what's happening here. No, the wonderful thing about sushi is it's got unique characteristics that make it awesome. And Italian food has unique characteristics that make it fantastic. That's the same that we're saying with male and female. In fact, their differences make them more powerful. I've got something that you don't have. You've got something that I don't have, and we need each other. This is what Anne Moore and David Giselle are talking about. 
Alice Eagley, she is a center left and an, an older kind of classic feminist. Um, she has written a good bit on this topic. But she says that the majority of studies looking at the difference in the politics of male and female in the academic literature, she says the majority of studies have confirmed in a general way people's ideals about the sexes. What she means there is our grandmothers, grandfathers, the people that shop at Walmart, the good kind of simple folk that live out there and fly over country. She's saying that the majority of studies have confirmed in a general way those ideas about the sexes. This evidence suggests that lay people, once much maligned in the feminist writings as misguided holders of gender stereotypes, I love this, may be fairly sophisticated observers of male and female behavior. So as you guys go back to your homes out there in the, you know, the rest of the country, Encourage your parents and your siblings that, you know, they um, may be fairly sophisticated observers of, of human behavior. In fact, another thing that Alice Eagley talks about is that she did a study and she finds out that in the literature and in cultural generally, there is a prejudice against this gender difference. But what she finds out is, and this should not be surprising to us, is that the prejudice is typically against men, not women, even in the academic literature. And that is because most people honor women. And even in academia that, you know, if, if we're going to throw the weight of benefit one way, it goes typically to women and properly so. So this idea that, well, difference means less than, that's only in some people's political ideology, not in reality. This fellow, um, Simon Baron Cohan, um, his cousin is, who's the movie actor? Yes. For the note, Peter is the first one that came up with that, okay? I've got all of his work. I love him. This is his uncle, but they're very, very different. His book, The Essential Differences, um, Man and Woman and the Extreme Male Brain, um, he says this, very first page, first chapter, the subject of essential sex differences in the mind is clearly very delicate. I could tiptoe around it, but my guess is that you would like the theory of the book stated plainly. So here it is. The female brain is predominantly hardwired for empathy, and the male brain is predominantly hardwired for understanding and building systems. We have heard about the sexual or the gender divide in Silicon Valley, it is not because Google or Apple is saying, you know what, we want more guys, disqualify the women who are coming here. No, it's just that men are more inclined to work in that area of just, you know, ones and zeros and that kind of technical sort of stuff. Actually, the boring stuff, I would say. This is good. This is the woman that I was talking to you about, Luann Brizendine. Her book, The Female Brain, she is a um, neurobiologist at the University of California, San Francisco. Her book, The Female Brain, and then she came out with another one called The Male Brain. If you want to read anything on this topic regarding male and female brain, read her stuff. Many times we hear, oh yes, of course, there's male and female differences, but women are more like men than they are different. Duh. Okay? <laughs> you know, they eat, they do things, they have two arms, two legs, five fingers, uh, ten, ten fingers, ten toes, those kinds of things. I like to say it's sort of the difference between, you know, sending Johnny Cash out to play for um, the prison, Folsom Prism, Folsom Prison with a ukulele. It's pretty much like a guitar, you know, just, just be happy with it. Well, she says more than 99% of male and female genetic coding 
is exactly the same. Out of the 30,000 genes in the human genome, less than 1% variation exists between the sexes. It's very, very small. But that 1% difference influences every single cell in our bodies. Men and women are different. They see the world differently. They operate differently. And so, back to our question, how different are they universally? This is what we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at is, is there a universal difference? Okay, back to this slide. Whoops. Um, look at some of these titles. Um, David Schmidt, um, Wendy Wood, and Alice Eagley, they've done a good bit of this work. Um, these guys down here, a guy named David Buss, um, who is at the University of Texas at Austin, they've done a lot of these. Sociosexuality from Argentina to Zimbabwe, A to Z, if you're not paying attention. <laughs> a 48-nation study of sex culture and strategies in human mating. Um, gender differences and personality traits across cultures, universal sex differences in desire in 52 nations, six continents, 13 islands. Um, this is why I brought these studies that I want to just show you or read to you. Here's another one. Gender difference in smiling, an, evolution, an evolutionary neuroandrogic theory. They find out, as we're going to see in a minute, that women smile more than men do. Again, a difference, but I would rather have more smilers around me than not. Patterns of universal adult romantic attachment across 62 cultures and regions. And these are all the main scholars who helped do this study. That's a lot of them. Five big traits, or the, the big five personality traits related to short-term mating across 46 nations. Why can't a man be more like a woman? Sex difference in the big five personality traits. That's a way that psychologists look at what are these big, humanly distinctive five personality traits across 55 cultures. Here's the Argentina to Zimbabwe one. Um, this is the one that I showed up there. Um, 52 nations, six continents, 13 islands. And what's interesting about even the islands is you have one distinct island and then another one on the other side of the world where they simply, those two societies could not have influenced one another, you know, in terms of, well, this island is this way because of social construct. Where did that social construct come from before um, the West came to them? So these studies... I mean, these people, evolutionary psychologists, secular anthropologists, are finding that, yes, indeed, there is a male and female nature. Before I go into what those specifics are, um, this is just one of the, the groups. Persistent gender stereotypes in the face of, of changing sex roles, evidence contrary to the sociocultural model. Okay, here's what they say. This accumulating evidence is inconsistent with the sociocultural explanation that gender, that sex difference is a social construct. It is more consistent with the currently emerging sociobiological research that holds gender difference reflects innate differences between the, re between the sexes resulting from the different reproductive strategies. That's not just about men impregnate women and women have babies, but how they, how women and men construct their life given their masculinity and their femininity. It's interesting here, before I go on to some of the research there, um, that some of these scholars, they got their research noticed by the New York Times. And this is a number of years ago. Let me see the date here, 2008. 
Um, the title of the New York Times article, As Barriers Disappear, Some Gender Gaps Widen. What they found out is that across these cultures from Argentina to Zimbabwe, that regarding economic freedom, regarding political freedom, that nations that had more economic freedom and individuality and ability to create our own lives because we don't have to go out and find today's food today, and the political freedom between men and women to assert their opinions, to vote, to work, to go out into the public square. Here's what they found based on this research, and the New York Times reported this. As personality tests were analyzed in all these countries, it looks as if personality differences between men and women are smaller in traditional cultures, like India's or Zimbabwe's, than in the Netherlands or the US. What this means is that when a country becomes more independent, more powerful politically and economically, and the people are empowered, and women can do what women choose to do, and men can do what men choose to do because of political freedom, because of finances, what they find out is their sex distinct personalities start to emerge or diverge, okay? It means that when women have the freedom, when men have the freedom, they start acting more like men, they start acting more like women. In un underdeveloped countries, men and women tend to kind of dress the same. They, you know, they wear long things, and you know, there's not a whole lot of difference. Go to any very fashionable part of any large city and look at the clothing stores. There are not any androgic clothing stores. There are some men's stores where, you know, thinner lapels and, you know, metrosexual kinds of things, but we know that they are men's clothes. You look at women particularly, extremely feminine, okay? Higher heels, skinnier dresses, thinner lines, brighter colors, things like that. Women are buying those things because the very well-educated, highly employed and earning women, that's what they are looking for. What makes me more feminine and more attractive, if you will, to the other sex, but smart all the same, right? So that's what the New York Times was reporting on is that these five big personality traits and things like that, they become diverse, more diverse in cultures where there's more economic and political freedom. Why is that the case? It is not a social construct. It's because women, when they give the freedom to be who they want to be, they become more distinct women. Men, the same way, in those ways. But the difference, the, the emergence or divergence, if you will, is primarily for the women. They go their own way. And you know what we ought to do? We ought to honor that. Let women be who women want to be. And if we do that, they're going to tend to be more feminine, more woman. I want to be a woman. It's interesting that, and this is just the complete opposite of this, androgyny is a social construct. Androgyny is the social construct. Androgyny just doesn't naturally exist. It has to be culturally created. And where is it culturally created? In the gender studies departments <laughs> at universities. Quite honestly, it just does not happen, OK? Now, I want to I wanna just throw out a couple of things. And this is the um, test part of the presentation. And what's interesting is these questions that I'm going to ask you or these things that I'm going to present to you come from this research and they fit our gender stereotypes of what male and female are but here's the kicker 
these things that I'm going to ask you about, present to you, what they find out is they are generally similar across all these diverse cultures, all these continents, all these islands, all these countries, all these language folks, okay, that these things are true of nearly all of them. What they find out is that activities performed interchangeably by male and female across all distinct human cultures range generally from zero to 35% of general human activity, okay? Those that are shared equally between male and female across all cultures from zero, there's none that is shared, to about 35%. All the rest is gender distinct. Another two leading scholars, the cross-cultural literature provides strong evidence for the universality of sex-typed division of labor, meaning these divisions of labor, one is male, one is female. And it's not just that the powerful males get to pick the fun stuff and give all the junk stuff to the women. No, it's, it's relative to their interests to their abilities, and to their particular skill sets. Although few activities, few activities such as, and think about who you think the males and the females are who do these jobs, such as trapping, hunting, metalwork, stonework, woodwork, fouling, care for the exterior of the home, and primary child care, care for the inside of the home, gathering vegetal foods, the, jet, the, you know, the, the things that grow, dairy production, spinning and clothes care, cooking, water supply, things like that. Those are differences that men and women tend to split. Think about that is care for the outside of the home and care maintenance for the inside of the home. Men tend to do the outside, women tend to do the inside in all human cultures. Why is that the case? It's because in only 1% of societies are the tasks of gathering the necessary resources of substance performed more by the women than by the men. The men and the women in these cultures divide these duties and they are generally distinct from culture to culture. Let me read a few of these things, um, and I'm just going to let you fill in the blanks there. Universally, one gender, other than the other gender, as opposed to the other, you, universally, one ranks substantially higher in assertiveness, and the other much higher in nurturance. Not because the culture dictates that they be that way, but simply because they are universally. You know what those two parts are. This is an interesting one. Women prefer to look at women's bodies over men's bodies, not just in our communities, all over the world. Women tend to look at women's bodies more than males' bodies. When I was doing the research for Secure Daughters, Confident Sons, I found out from a number of women that when another woman walks in the room, it's not the men who size her up so quickly. It's the women, you know? Where is she on where I am as attractiveness? Am I less or more? Is she less or more than me? Men are typically more adventurous, excited, and willing to take risks and move out into new areas. They are also more overtly influential in terms of leadership. Women are most interested and concerned about life events and situations closer to home. Men are more likely to be interested and concerned with events and situations beyond the village. Where women see danger and concern, and it's good for them, because that's where we get the warnings from, men tend to see challenges. You know, you do not find many female storm chasers, right? <laughs> you know, it's stupid men, right? Okay? 
Men tend to be more that way. Every culture needs both of those things. Like I said, women tend to smile more often than men. Both men and women prefer to look at female bodies rather than male bodies. Women focus more on their appearance than men. This is an interesting thing as well because the scholars that did this research, they wanted to play kind of a trick on their data gatherers. And so what they did is sort of a side project. They have male, female students going out and collecting the data. Is there any difference in the kinds of data that men and women students collect? Yes, there was. They said that the males were tend to be just more objective, black and white. The women were tended to be more colorful, more personality driven you know, to describe details about the individual that were more relational, okay? Which actually is better if you're a data collector? Just this black and white raw, you know, data, or to get the raw data, but also, you know, this person was gregarious, this person seemed sad, this person, you know, just lost a loved one a few days ago. See, women are more detail-oriented in those ways universally. This is interesting. This is always interesting to the ladies. Men's ideal female body shape is heavier than what women assume. And not just in our inner cities where fashion is such a big thing. This is true from Argentina to Zimbabwe. Men are actually interested more in women that are a little bit heavier than most women assumed. That's fascinating to me. In terms of suicide, women attempt suicide more often than men, humanly universal. Men succeed at suicide more often than women, and their suicides are much more violent. Men and women, in terms of, this is a horrible subject, but hanging, um, more men, but some women, gunshots, hardly ever women, overdose of pills, nearly always women. There is that kind of difference there. It's interesting, I wanna, wanna end with just a few things on self-esteem. Boys tend to have higher athletic confidence and self-esteem than girls. Generally, girls tend to perform better academically and receive better grades than boys, but their academic self-esteem is similar. So, boys don't do as well than girls, but they feel super confident about how they're doing academically, <laughs> right? So we have this idea, well, we, you know, girls aren't doing as well in math and science and those things, so we've got to boost those women up. You know what, we do have to boost up girl students, but it is humanly universal. It's not just because one culture doesn't celebrate and hold up women. There is something there in the male and female nature. Girls generally have higher behavioral and moral self-esteem than girls, than, than boys do. See, that's interesting. So, you know, they do have higher self-esteem, but in particular areas. You know, it's kind of the boys rule I'm sorry, girls rule, boys don't have good manners, you know? Um, and that's very true there. But it's interesting that guys, it's interesting that guys tend to have more confidence about their looks and appearance, as one of the scholars put it, even when they have no right to, you know? I'm looking pretty good. And women, okay, my daughters, I've got four daughters, you are just stinking beautiful today. Oh, Dad, I look horrible, you know? No, I'm a guy, you know? Believe me, you just look fantastic. And so men and women need to know that. We look at things differently. And not only just in our own cultures, but across human cultures. That means that, as Sylvia and Agazinski said, there are two ways of being human male and female, 
and male has a particular meaning and practice and demonstration, and female has a particular practice and meaning and demonstration in all human cultures. That's very important. That's very significant. Here's what these researchers did not find. You look in the, in the data sets and in the graphs and the charts, they did not find other genders that do not fit in the male or the female. There are no categories in there with asterisks, no category for this individual's gender or sex difference. They found males and females everywhere they went. As I say very often, pretend, you know, I'm the anthropology professor and I say tomorrow we're going to go someplace in the world and we're going to study that culture. We get ourselves on a plane, we start going there, but like what happened in Lost, the plane crashes, we don't know where we are. We start to observe the natives there. Nobody is going to say, okay, the males and the females, we understand them, but what are these other people? The gender studies people would say, oh, no, no, those are, you know, one of the 50 or 60 other genders that there are in the world. Nowhere in the world, again, except for on college campuses <laughs> or maybe over at HRC, are you going to see any other different kind of gender? Now, let me end with this. There are 101 different ways to be a good female. There are 101 different ways to be a good male. You know, um, Clint Eastwood is not Mr. Rogers, but Mr. Rogers is a very good man. Clint Eastwood is a very good man. There, you know, um, pick out some current actress of the day is not Amelia Earhart, is not Margaret Thatcher, you know, but the two types are very good kinds of females. And we know this. We interact with people like this. She's a different female than she is, but you know what? They're both great, solid, healthy females. So we need to know that. There is that large difference between in maleness and femaleness, but we can always observe it, which takes us back to Richard Simmons that I half jokingly show him, but he makes the case that Richard proves that there is an objective way to be female and male, and he doesn't really fit either one of them, and he does it intentionally. So, open to questions. We have about 10 minutes, um, and anybody who has to leave just at the top of the hour um, at 1 can do that, but um, anybody's free to ask questions, and I've been asked all the questions, ugly and kind. Actually, more of the ugly ones, so um, don't feel like you're hurting my feeling. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Bill Gallo. I'm a reporter for Voice of America. Um, can you address the issue of intersex individuals? You mentioned, yeah. you quoted people and you said also yourself that there were only two choices, male and female. Yes. But obviously there are the existence, I mean, there is yes. intersex people, people born with ambiguous genitalia, <coughs> things like that. How do you address that? It's a very, very good question. The, if you look at um, the Intersex Society of North America, ISNA, go to their website and look at is intersex a different gender or a different sex? They will say absolutely not. Intersex is not a third gender. It is fascinating that the intersex community is not an ideological or political community. They, these are simply people that have an objective, either physical by um, ambiguous genitalia or some genetic ambiguity there. It is objective. You can see it. You can, and, and these are people that don't wrestle. They don't have gender dysphoria, if you will. Or they don't see themselves as something different than male and female. They just see that the physical and genetic indicators of humanity, of male and female, don't simp they, they don't present themselves as is average. I don't want to say normal. They don't use normal, but is average. And so they are working from the beginning 
and there's different philosophies here, to determine what are you really more of. Are you really more of female or more of male? And what the intersex society of North America says is let the child grow and not let them determine, but see what emerges. See what emerges from them. But there's also genetic stuff. I mean, if you, know, you have physically um, gender ambiguous physical body parts, but you look at the genetics. What is the genetics? The genetics override a vagina that hasn't formed or a penis that hasn't formed. Most of these people, nearly to a person, just simply doesn't see themselves or as a third or different sex. They see themselves as either male or female, but certain things just don't present in the typical way. It's interesting, you see LGBTQQI intersex. The intersex people do not put themselves within that alphabet soup because they are not politically or ideologically driven, typically. And that's very interesting. So, yeah, intersex is a very different kind of animal um, in that way. Now, that's not to say that there's not intersex people that get involved in LGBT politics and see themselves as something unique. You know what? All of us have the freedom to see whatever our story is as something unique and different. Um, and many of us are, are doing that today. Um, yes, sir. Hi, Ken Dante, Omega Forum. Uh, I'm just going to give some reactions uh -huh. to what you're saying, and respectfully. Thank you. It seems very zero sum. When I look at different cultures, in some cultures, the, like the Native American, there were people called Hayoka. Yeah. And they were kind of male, female, that strange androgynous space, but they were seen as the sacred people. They were seen as having a special gift, not as being something wrong. In Eastern culture, you know, you have the yin and the yang symbol yes. in Chinese culture. I want to take it out of Western culture a second because we tend to see what we desire to see, which may be this zero-sum type of game, black mm -hmm. or white. And in the yin-yang symbol, there's always a little bit of white in the black, black yep. in the white, and it's sort of, instead of saying gender, it's masculinity and femininity. The original symbol uh, of the yin and yang comes from a stream. Yes. On one side of the stream, it's in the sun, so it's hot. Right. On the other side of the stream, it's in the shade, so there it's cool. That's the yin. Yes. The sun is the yang. And there's some gradation between them. Now, beyond formalized sex roles, I think of people that are artistic. I worked as a therapist and counselor. And some of the people I work with were less cognitive and rationalistic and much more intuitive. And I, I would even call it they were in touch with the divine feminine. Mm -hmm. We have very, we've even applied gender differences to yeah. the divinity. There's God, the Father, and then there's the rest of it. In other yeah. cultures, there's more of a sense of male, female, a flow between the two. Mm -hmm. And I say this because so much of the religious base will desire to see something as an absolute black or white. And this is a very bad pun, but I don't know that we can get Jack quite back in the box again. Or Jill. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot, lot there. And, and very, very good points. Um, first of all, in the Native American communities, yes, there is that. There's in some um, an individual called the Berdachi, um, and, and with that is celebrated same-sex marriage. But they're, they really are quite different than how they have been, and I'll just say it, co-opted by the gay and lesbian community. That they are um, typically, that individual tends to be more of a she-male. It's sort of, if you will, um, the Richard Simmons type, um, the maybe the Mr. Rogers type, a man who is physically male, but he's got clear kind of identities for the feminine. He's, we would call, not in a nice way in our culture, the Nancy boys growing up. And so it's not that they disprove the rule. They actually do prove the rule because we understand them based on the binary. They do not fit either in the male or the female category, 
but they are a mix of the two. It's interesting that you, um, you know, in Taoism and, and the yin and the yang, um, I have thought about that a good bit because the opposites, you're right, they need each other to define the other. But in a sense of same-sex marriage, that in a way, and, and that's not what you're asking about, but it says the yin and the yang doesn't really matter. You can have two yins and you can have two yangs, right? Which is... But no, that, but see, that violates the philosophy because of humanity. Right. Which is humanity. That's the circle. And then you have the communion and interaction and union between the yin and the yang, the male and the female. And yes, the little dots in there, there is femininity in me, okay? I pick up the clothes in my home and I get frustrated with my wife because she leaves the clothes on the floor, you know? I mean, there are women that, you know what? They can weight lift, they can box, they can cage fight, you know? I would live three seconds in a cage fight with them. Do I say, well, they're actually just men. They ought to just admit that they're men. No, they are women who can do men things in a man way. But that does not disprove the nature of womanhood. And then you said a word. It doesn't confuse But it doesn't confuse the categories. We do not think about, um, who's the woman um, indie driver? Danica. We don't look, is, is that, is the name right? We don't look at her and, you know, I wish she had just stopped confusing the categories and be at home and make cookies like good women are supposed to do. Nobody thinks that she's uppity or that she is challenging the binary norm. We just recognize, you know what? She's a woman who can kick butt and good for her. Same thing, not to hold up Sarah Palin, but she can field dress a moose, okay? <laughs> Nobody within our very conservative community is like, you know what, I don't like her because she needs to be at home in her skirt making cookies for the kids. No, we recognize that women can do man things and you can celebrate that, that there are men who can do women things. So in the zero sum game, no, none of us live in this objective black and white, men are absolutely this way and females are that way. The thing in the research is women tend to do this universally and men tend to do this universally. So um, it's a very, very good question. I think a very important one, yeah. It's one o'clock. Um, I don't want to keep people here any longer than they need to be or can be, but I'm happy to, to take other questions and I'll try to answer them quicker. Yes, sir. Uh, so oftentimes you see, um, like in same-sex couples, like at least for me, I see one take more of a feminine role and one take a masculine role. Can you explain that uh, and the um, reason for that? You, I, I hear that a lot, and, and you do see that, but you don't see it all the time. Um, sometimes you have two guys very, very masculine. Sometimes you see two women extremely feminine, and then you have people kind of in the mix there. I think we recognize the mix there because it's so different and distinct. But I would like to say something about um, same-sex couples that we think, you know, we celebrate the same-sex couple because they transcend the gender norms. They are challenging that. But, and the Atlantic Monthly had a story on this a number of years ago, what straights can learn from gay marriage. And I wrote an article on this in First Things that um, you can find it. Two things that the researcher in there admitted was one distinction with male gay partners, long-term partners, is that an overwhelming, nearly a majority of them have what she called, or what we could call, agreements on extracurricular sexual activity, meaning 
we both agree. In fact, a number of uh, same-sex marriage advocates will say, you know, if you ask them, so are you monogamous in your relationship? They'll say, now, do you mean monogamous or faithful? And you're like, is there a difference? Yes, there's a difference. Monogamous means we only have sex with one person. This is coming out of their mouth. I've heard it a number of times. Monogamous means we only have sex with one person. Being faithful is we live by the agreements and rules of our relationship. And so many will say we can have outside relationships, but the rules are sim things like you can only do it when you're out of town. You can never bring the person home to our house. Or it's not somebody that you have an emotional attachment to. Or when it happens, I want to know about it. Or when it happens, I don't want to know about it. Fidelity is living by those rules. Now, in the lesbian relationships, and this is well known and well established in research, in fact, even the feminist research, that feminist, I'm, I'm sorry, lesbian relationships break up at extremely high rates. You have heterosexual cohabiting and married couples break up at a high rate. You have the men break up at twice the rate. Women, same-sex women relationships, break up 73% more than the men do. And the lesbian literature talks about that. There, there's a male nature to the gay question, and there's a female nature to the lesbian question. Men, and we find this in this literature, tend to be more sexually adventurous. You give them more opportunities, more adventure, opportunities for more diversity, and guess what? If there's no harm of getting caught or, you know, something bad happening, they will seek those out. Tend to, not every man, but the male nature, the raw male nature, is toward that direction. So when you have two men doing that, you know, like, okay, let's work something out. We get to come home to somebody, to love somebody, to commit ourselves to somebody, but we can also have our cake and eat it too. For the women, the reason those relationships break up at such high levels, and again, the reporter, she's a science reporter for the Washington Post, she wrote this article, she finds these two things. The reason women break up at tremendously high rates is, and the lesbian scholars point this out, is the relational intensity of women. I don't mean that in an ugly way, but one of the lesbian scholars even says, when you have two women or two individuals in the relationship who feel like very often we have to talk about the relationship, okay, very few relationships can withstand that kind of relational intensity, okay? So they're fragile, so they break up. But we have the yin and the yang, okay? We have the male who, if he can have more sexual freedom and diversity, he's going to do it. But you have the woman who offsets him. You know what, I know you'd like to have lots of different girlfriends, but no, you know? We ain't gonna do it. You have the woman who, wants to talk about the relationship. She wants to go out on more dates. She wants to invest more in the relationship. And it's not that the man doesn't want to do that, but he moderates that. And we find that these two things work together to balance those natures out. When you take one of the yang or the, the yin or the yang out, we have the male relationship, same-sex problem, which the Atlantic pointed out, or we have the female problem which we pointed out. What's interesting there, and I'll, I'll close with this, but you had a question and I'll, I'll, I'll be open to take yours, um, is when we say we don't need either, we find out that we do. We think we can move away and know we don't really need male and female, but when we do, unexpected things start to happen and they have happened in these sorts of relationships and they will continue to happen and reveal themselves in these sorts of relationships. So, first of all, that would be his second question. Anybody else? Okay, we'll take your question and that'll be it. Um, it seems there's an increasing word. Sorry. It seems
seems like there's an increasingly large number of scientists that are publishing um, research suggesting that there is some kind of biological determinant to gender identity. And this has to do with maybe with brain scans. We've talked about hormonal exposure, things like that. Mm -hmm. Can you address that? I mean, it seems like there's more and more people who are saying this. So at least is there, uh, what response would you have to that? Meaning, if I, if I understand your question, um, that there's more science saying that there's science behind gender identity, that I am male not just because the society says I should be or I was pushed in that way by society, but inherently, objectively, scientifically within me, there's things that, that determine there that I'm male. Some sort of biological component to gender identity Absolutely. As well. Okay. So yeah. Because these scholars say that. It's, it's not that it's just purely culture or that it's not culture. There's a part of that. Absolutely. Well, gender identity. And, and if you make that gender identity you know. in the sense of, um, of male and female. But there is absolutely no research whatsoever that even comes close to indicating that there is any inherent essence or that you could do, not to be crude this way, but that you could do an autopsy on an individual or break them down and say, okay, this is a transgender individual because this part of their anatomy, this part, or this part of their, their physiology, their DNA. Have you seen like um, what people say about, talk about these brain scans, for instance, they'll show differences between transgender individuals and uh, heterosexual individuals in, in certain ways, like anatomical pathways, size, function. Of we brain. have all heard about them mm -hmm. because the media is crazy about reporting on them, but none of them are replicated. And you even just read the studies themselves, and the authors will talk about the problems with their own research. But we just don't hear that by our critical thinking journalists. It is, it is remarkable. And I don't mean this ideologically or politically. It is stunning how uncritical good journalists are on that topic. They simply do their reporting from press release. Because you read these studies, I mean, right there in the discussion of the study, the scholar is is answering it himself. This does not prove anything. This has to be replicated. And you don't have people coming along replicating those things. I will tell you this, and this is a radical statement, and I'm welcome to be challenged. There is nothing that is objectively, objectively provable or indicative of transgender. You look at the definitions themselves from the gay and lesbian groups and the policy that the Obama administration put out two Fridays ago. They say that sexual orientation or that being transgender is rooted in the deep personal sense of how one understands themselves to be. If there was an objective scientific test tube kind of thing, they would refer to that. But they define it by that very subjective thing of, I sense I'm a woman, and nobody can tell me otherwise. And there is no part of me or the transgender person that has to go through any change clothes-wise, physically, to prove the point. In fact, they can't even be questioned about that because if you were to question me, you would be doubting my own claim and identity of myself. So that's a good question. Okay, well, Glenn, thank you so much. You're very um, welcome. And, uh, very thought-provoking, and again, if you want to talk to Glenn, I think he has a few copies of his book as well, uh, the Secure Daughters, Confident Sons book for those here in D.C. Thank you to those who have joined us online, and this concludes this uh, Family Policy Lecture. Thank you.